that term, um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Siti Mariam. Associate Professor Dr. Siti Mariam works in Faculty of Dentistry, UITM, as a Deputy Dean Academic. And she is also the consultant prosthodontist registered under the Malaysian National Specialist Register. She obtained her master's in clinical dentistry in prosthodontics after completing a three year specialist training from the University of Edinburgh in 2011. Currently, she is teaching fix and removal prosthodontics to undergrad and postgrad students in UITM and a visiting lecturer in other dental schools. She has been invited as external examiner for professional examination and thesis locally and internationally. She had the opportunity to work in the Minnesota Dental Research Center for Biomaterials and Biomechanics in USA for in 2016, and also in King South University Riyadh as a research visiting scholar. The team has secured multiple grants to conduct research in Malaysia with international collaborators in the field of dental materials and prosthodontics. She has presented her research findings and clinical cases at international platform and published journal articles from undergrad restorative dentistry textbooks. To date, she is the president of International Association for Dental Research, RADR, Relation Section, a counselor for the Asian Academy of Prosthodontics, and also the counselor for RADR Southeast Asia uh, Division. Tonight, as I said, Professor Dr. Siti Mariam will speak to us on the title Design Efficiency Material Feasibility and Techniques for Efficiency for a Better Outcome of Resin Bonded Prosthesis. Dr. Siti Mariam, the webinar is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Datu, for the kind introduction. It is an honor to be introduced by your mentor. Thank you, Prof. Datu, again. And thank you to International College of Dentists for the platform for us to share knowledge among our colleagues. Okay, let me share my screen now. Okay, is it okay with everyone? Yeah, you're good. Okay, from the kind introduction, yes, indeed, I am from the Center for Restorative Dentistry Studies, Faculty of Dentistry, UITM. This is our beautiful school, and I would like to take the opportunity to welcome colleagues from uh, other places to come and visit us and collaborate with us for any research or any academic matters. And I am, uh, as been introduced, I was in University of Malaya for my undergraduate and had the opportunity to work in University of Minnesota and King South University. Okay, let's go to the important matters for the day. I have about 45 minutes and looking from the title, it's quite long because we are going to cover resin bonded bridges in terms of design efficiency, material feasibility and technique proficiency for a better outcome of these processes, okay? So let's start with a bit on minimal invasive prosthodontic. To be honest, for the past um, few years, I've been talking to colleagues from other specialties and also colleagues from other places. And it seems that resin bonded bridges has not gained its popularity as much as I expected it to be. Um, the reason is because resin bonded bridges is considered one of the minimal invasive prosthodontic. We are moving from the traditional prosthodontic where we cut tooth and we require um, geometry to preparation for retention and resistance of our prosthesis. However, with minimal invasive prosthodontic, the progress in adhesive mechanism, the progress and advancement in dental material allow us not to cut uh, or even a very minimal tooth structure uh, removal uh, before receiving the uh, final prosthesis. Let's go a bit on resin bonded bridges. It's a fixed partial denture looted to two structure, which has been etched to provide retention. This is from the glossary of prosthodontic, the ninth edition. And the interesting is from the study from Kern in 2016. 
clinical studies on the success and survival of resin-bonded bridges reported a 95.4% survival rate over 10 years of a cantilevered all ceramic resin-bonded bridges. This is a very important uh, report from the literature that shows us that this material has been long enough for a, a survival studies and it has shown a very good number. Uh, the last sentence by Adelhoff and Sorensen is about tool preparation, which I would like to emphasize in the next slide, where tool preparation has a risk to pulpal vitality. Approximately 63 to 70% of coronal tool structure is removed for crown preparation. So from this sentence, let's go to the okay, let me go here to the next slide, which is to show the differences between resin bonded bridges versus the conventional bridges. As you can see on your left side, the conventional bridges it either is a fix fix or a cantilever. We are still doing the um, crown preparation or the abutment preparation where a a significant number of two preparation is going to be removed. But if you look at resin bonded bridges, the case that you see on your right side, this is actually a hypodontia case, a 90 year old girl where she congenitally missing uh, lateral and uh, undergo orthodontic treatment to provide sufficient space for the pontic. What we provided to her was a resin bonded bridge with a fixed fixed design. So this patient has been seen for more than 10 years and the cantilever, sorry, the resin bonded bridge are still functioning well. Let's go a bit on the advantage of RBB. You have seen how it looks like and you have seen uh, the main differences with the conventional bridges. Number one, it is comfortable and no anesthesia required. It's good for patient uh, uh, who does not uh, like a needle, less demanding post-operatively. We are talking about uh, sensitivity after tool preparation, which rarely happen in resin bonded bridges. Complications are more superstructure and not biological. Uh, this is, uh, we, if we look into the literature, most of the complications are either deborn or it's a fracture of the superstructure of the framework. And it's not biological means it does not involve uh, the vitality of the tooth. Uh, the other advantage of RBB is the reversible treatment options, especially while waiting for growth. Very rare to develop secondary caries at margin and it is financially affordable by patients. Okay, um, remember the long title that I gave for the ICD. So um, in 45 minutes, I'm going to cover three main things, which is the design of the processes, the material progression, the technique development. However, all this will start with the case selection. And at the end of the um, presentation, we are going to look on longevity studies and also the current and um, previous research that has been conducted on RBB. So we'll go through case selection. Resin bonded bridges are mostly for replacing missing tooth. Uh, it can be single and sometimes it can be multiple and it can be done anterior or posteriorly. Patients who are needle phobic, so this is a very good case selection. Young patient, this is more related to the occlusal establishment and adaptation. Long-term provisionalization, especially in patients who undergo bone grafting, you need to wait before, uh, if your final prosthesis is implant placement, then you can go for a resin bonded bridges as a long-term provisional. Post-orthodontic fixed retention, you can use it as a retainer for the post-orthodontic uh, patients. Time limitation for multiple and long visit treatment. This is also a good case selection for resin bonded bridges. Before we start any treatment, as Okay, um, I only have 45 minutes, so some of the section I will go through very fast because it's the fundamental, but we will focus on things which uh, we need to discuss more and I need to explain uh, better. Get to know the patient is all about the patient complaint, relevant medical history, dental history, social history and habits. The reason these five questions or these five information that you need from patient because sometimes it will give you the etiology, the reason for the missing teeth and if the patient have any unusual habits that might interfere with your treatment planning. The other uh, important matters is the relevant medical history, especially in probably in two where cases, you need to know if patient have any medical problem uh, that might need to be managed before it further aggravate the oral diseases. 
The next thing that we always go before we provide any uh, fixed prosthodontic treatment is the five clinical parameters. We always look at the restorative part, uh, meaning the teeth, the periodontal, the edentulous area that we're going to replace, the occlusion of the patient, and also the aesthetic. Thorough examination, as usual, when we learn during our undergraduate and even our daily practice, we will look at skeletal pattern, the temporal mandible joint, and the smile. Smile is more when you are replacing the anterior teeth. The intraoral will go into the soft tissue, and you might do a, a basic periodontal examination, the BPE and the gingiva and the oral hygiene status. General dental condition, usually we'll do the charting to check any presence of tooth wear. And if we have an edentulous bridges um, condition, we need to look at the space, the mesiodistal space and the interocclusal space. This is very important in replacing because it will uh, reflect to the pontic shape and design that you're going to provide for the patient. The next one is occlusal feature. Um, we are going to look at the static occlusion and the dynamic occlusion. Most of the time, the dynamic occlusion, uh, we tend to forget. We are always looking at the static occlusion. We, when we provide a prosthesis or we do treatment and we check with the articulating uh, paper or acufilm, we check on the static occlusion. However, dynamic occlusion is very important because you do not want your prosthesis the main thing is your pontic to be involved in any excursion. So no um, contact should be at the pontic of any bridge or any prosthesis that you provide. And also you need to look at interferences at the non-working site because sometimes we are focusing on the working site. On During the excursion, we forgot to check on the non-working site interference. And the different occlusal scheme that you need to assess in the patient is the canine guidance, whether the patient has canine guidance or the patient has a group function or bilateral balance articulation. The last one is more for the denture patient. But for dented patient, and we are giving a fixed prosthodontic, you need to look uh, on the canine guidance and whether it's a group function. Okay, we have gone to the case selection for resident bonded bridges. Now I'm going into the design of the prosthesis. When we look at the design of the prosthesis, we always look back at the selecting the suitable abutment. You need to look at the tooth size and shape uh, for the abutment, the restorative status, the angulation of the tooth, the periodontal uh, status, and the position. It was not say that if the patient have a reduced periodontal support, it is a contraindication to provide a cantilever design. However, it must be um, done carefully and it has be, must be informed to the patient on the prognosis of that kind of prosthesis, relying on a uh, periodontal status, which is a bit compromised. So it is not a contraindication. It can still be done, but it has to be informed properly to the patient. Okay, let's look at the traditional way. This is, I think, Everyone has seen these images. This is from Schillingberg, Fundamental of Pix Prosthodontic Book, where if you do um, conventional bridges, and uh, these are the components that you need to provide. You have the retainer, you have the pontic and the connector, and the abutment is being prepared. In the traditional prosthodontic, where we cut our the, the abutment into a retainer, we need to look at the dislodged forces that the abutment or the prosthesis is going to receive. And during the preparation, the geometry of tooth preparation is very important. When we say geometry of tooth preparation, we are talking about total of conversion, the clinical crown height, um, the auxiliary groove. These are the geometry to preparation. And the last one, retention of prosthesis is about the adhesion, which we will focus in at the later the part of the sharing session about the mechanism of adhesion, which has been improved from the previous till nowadays. Okay, so now uh, in resin bonded bridges, because it's a minimal invasive prosthodontic, porcelain fused to metal resin bonded bridges abutment preparation, I would say that these two designs that I put the cross are the design which is not accepted anymore which people do not do because it has not 
proven that it improved the retention or the resistance of the resin bonded bridges. So what people are doing nowadays, most of the clinician, they are doing a guide plane to allow maximum material adaptation to the tooth in the interproximal area. As you can see on the photo of your right side, removal of prominent undercut that might interfere with retainer adaptation and seating. The example are if you have a very sharp uh, marginal ridges and if you have a very deep fissure, probably you can smoothen any sharp uh, angle because you want to improve the adaptation of your retainer. As I said, no occlusal receipt for mechanical resistant form. It has not been proven. No occlusal reduction for retainer space. This one, we will discuss more about the dull concept. And nowadays, um, we are moving towards all ceramic because of the aesthetic purposes. Uh, the preparation for all ceramic resin bonded bridges involve a gingival finishing margin, 0.5 millimeter chamfer, cingulum pinhole for seating and proximal box to increase the rigidity of the connector. This is from uh, Matthias Kern. Um, he has done quite a number of uh, studies and research on um, all ceramic resin bonded bridges and his preparation design has been widely accepted uh, worldwide. Uh, to, to show that it is a good uh, design and improve the seating and the rigidity of the prosthesis. Creating space for resin bonded retainer. There are two ways that we will discuss today. One is the occlusal or palatal surface preparation, 0 0.7 to 1.5 millimeter. Um, the amount, it depends on the material of your framework. Number two is application of dull concept or known as relative axial tooth movement. Okay, um, looking back at number one, creating space is uh, occlusal or palatal surface uh, preparation. Remember, resin bonded bridges rely solely uh, on adhesion. Enamel is the best substrate for us to bond any prosthesis. So this um, diagram actually show you the enamel thickness for most of the teeth that you can see here. For molar at the occlusal, you do get about 2.0 2 millimeter. But for the anterior, if you look at the, we are more concerned about the palatal because we want, we will bond the retainer at the palatal surface. I would say it's about 0 0.3 to 0 0.8 or minimum than that. So that is why, um, in most of the cases, I do not do, and it is uh, commonly accepted that no, no tooth reduction is done for a resin bonded bridges retainer because we are applying now on the concept of dull or known as the relative axial tooth movement. Uh, for posterior teeth, yes, when you have an enamel of 2.0, you might say, okay, I can actually prep 0 0.7 or even 1 millimeter for my uh, metal retainer so that um, I will not interfere with the occlusion, meaning that you will be providing everything in confirmative approach. However, if you are given a choice to bond on an uncut enamel and a cut uh, prepared enamel, which one will be your choice? I would say definitely we want to bond on a fresh enamel, uh, uncut enamel, because the bonding is much better than any preparation. So the next one that we will go about uh, the, the design is the retainer design. Retainer is the one that is covering the abutment. So uh, with the current studies and has been proven, full coverage of palatal anterior and occlusal posterior teeth are the best design for the retainer. As you can see from the photograph on your right side, the occlusal, the molar has been covered the whole occlusal to get the maximum coverage. Posterior retainer, the lingual is 180 degree wrap around the abutment. You can see from the photo there. And for occlusal coverage, posterior and cingulum uh, shelf, it will help to direct occlusal load force axially. And the number of retainer, uh, you can either make it a cantilever or a fixed fix design. However, allow me to update or inform or share with you about the, the, the number of retainer. Uh, it actually in resin bonded bridges because this, the, the main um, mechanism of uh, retainer is retaining is by adhesion. 
And it has been proven that uh, one retainer or a cantilever design has a higher um, uh, success or longevity. The reason is because if you bond fix fix and you have two apartments with different mobility, the, 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 the risk of the bond to happen at one of the retainer is much, much higher. So that is uh, the reason nowadays, a lot of studies have shown that cantilever design uh, survive much, much better than the fixed fixed design of resin bonded bridges. I understand because initially when I started with uh, providing resin bonded bridges, I feel more secure if I have two retainer to hold a pontic. However, it has been uh, proven again and again, the cantilever design uh, survived better because of the uh, periodontal support on that tooth is solely on one retainer instead of two different uh, support on uh, uh, resin bonded bridges. Uh, this is a cantilever design. Uh, these are some of the cases that me and my colleague has done. Uh, that as you can see, the arrow shows the pontic and the side is the retainer. So you can see that most of the time, it, it is expected um, that a smaller pontic will survive with a bigger retainer, meaning you have a maximum coverage on the abutment. In a fixed fixed design, you can still do a fixed fixed design uh, to have two retainer. And this is example of anterior and a posterior teeth. Okay, we have discussed about uh, the coverage and the number of retainer. Let's look into connector design. If we look back into, if we read into the journal about longevity studies and success of resin bonded bridges, most of the failure, as I mentioned earlier, it actually happens either debond or fracture of the framework, which most of the time it happened at the connector design. So connector design, when you design a connector, you, the aim is to have a maximum height, but to make sure that you are not encroaching the gingival embrasure space because they will, this will interfere with the cleaning and also with the aesthetic. Connector must be very rigid and able to withstand load force. Rigidity is proportional to cube of retainer height or cluso gingivally, we're talking about the height and directly proportional to its width, we are talking about the bacolingual width. Flexibility can cause cement failure interface. We will talk a bit on material. I just wanted to mention that in order for a connector to be rigid, the choice of material that you choose must be able to provide this criteria. And the other way to provide, uh, to achieve the aim, which is the maximum height, is to do a guide, uh, interproximal guide plane. As this photo, if you can see this more, it has a bulbous and imagine that you are going to put a ponte on the side, you will not be able to get a good adaptation of a molar of a connector at that bulbous area. So the preparation that we will do for uh, before uh, uh, taking impression for the resin bonded bridges is to do a guide plane so that you have a flat interproximal, which will eventually give you a good connector height and rigidity to withstand any occlusal uh, load. The next one is about the pontic design. If you remember from the first, um, uh, not the first, when, when I put on the Schillingberg design of a conventional bridge, they have the retainer, they have the connector and the pontic. So it is still similar with resin bonded bridges, the same uh, component of a bridge uh, applied to RBB. So pontic design should be in a passive contact with tissue for hygiene purposes. And the type of pontic that we use are the modified ridge lab and the ovate pontic. The sanitary, the bullet and ridge lab are not advisable due to the hygiene purposes and also aesthetic. What uh, I put here are the images from a British Dental Journal in 2011. It's about the ovate pontic. You can see from the um, pre-operative uh, photograph, the, the shape of the occlusal ridge uh, the, at the edentulous area is straight. It does not, if you do not do anything and you provide a pontic, it will not be aesthetic. But you can still get a bit of aesthetic with the modified ridge lab. 
However, uh, a bit of modification, modification of the soft tissue has been done with electrocautery to provide uh, an ovate shape so that an ovate pontic can be uh, given to the patient. And you can, as you can see, and uh, that the aesthetic looks much better. It seems that the pontic is emerging out from the gingival tissue. The next one we are going to touch is about material progression. Allow me to talk about the different material for resin bonded bridges. It's not that much. The only option that you have is a porcelain fused to metal, PFM, where you have the metal framework and the porcelain as the veneering. And the other material is the all ceramic. Okay, we are going to discuss more about all ceramic because um, for a lot of people who, who are not um, into material, uh, I will discuss more about the different type of ceramic because the different type of ceramic will uh, affect your bonding um, protocol in order for you to get the best adhesion mechanism for your processes later. A bit on the um, porcelain fused to metal first, about the metal framework. Remember, we were talking about rigidity, especially the connector needs the rigidity. So if you use a metal, most of the time for resin bonded bridges, the metal that they are using is either a nickel chromium or a cobalt chromium. They will not use noble or precious metal because uh, of the rigidity is compromised in this noble and precious metal. So the non-precious, such as the cobalt chrome and also the um, nickel chrome are the best material for a resin bonded bridges framework. The next one is in all ceramic. Okay, ceramic comes in, the easiest way to differentiate ceramic is based on the non-silica base and the silica base. The non-silica base that we always hear is the the zirconia or alumina is still around in the market. The silica base is start with your felspatic that most of the time we do for our veneer cases. The leucite reinforced, uh, fluoramica glass ceramic and lithium disilicate, which is Emax. I'm just showing some of the um, photograph on the a different type of ceramic. The reason is I will then explain how the bonding mechanism is going to occur in the different type of uh, ceramic. If you look at felspatic and leucite reinforced, you can see the glass matrix and the crystal uh, inside. But if you look into lithium disilicate, mostly you will see crystalline structure. However, they still have some glass matrix around. But if you look at zirconia, this is an example of yttria stabilized zirconia, there is no glass matrix at all. So that is why zirconia is considered as a non-silica base. It does not have silica particles as, a com as part of its composition. Uh, before we move uh, to material, more about um, adhesion, Allow me to talk a bit on the failure of prosthesis. It's either a chipping or a fracture. Um, the reason I'm putting this slide because nowadays uh, we are moving towards a monolithic all ceramic prosthesis, and people uh, and the manufacturers are pushing it to for anterior resin bonded bridges. Before, if we want a all ceramic uh, resin bonded bridges or any bridges we're talking about, we need to use zirconia, right? Because zirconia is known for its 1,200 megapascal flexural strength, which is very high and it can uh, withstand the occlusal load. Uh, however, because of aesthetic purposes, uh, sometimes uh, there are case selection which is suitable for lithium disilicate as a resin bonded bridges and you can get it in monolithic processes. Um, nowadays, for the past uh, recent year, um, the uh, manufacturers has come up with monolithic uh, zirconia, which was said to have an aesthetic comparable to lithium disilicate, means that it does not need the veneering layer. So if you have a monolithic prosthesis, that's the best because you will get the structure rigidity uh, there instead of uh, veneering because they might have the uh, complication of chipping that will require repair or even replacement. 
For porcelain fused to metal, if chipping occur, it looks very ugly with the metal showing. However, in, in all ceramic, uh, using a framework of zirconia and uh, felspatic veneering, it, it doesn't show any metal because the underlying is still all ceramic. However, it will uh, compromise the shape and a bit of the aesthetic of the processes. So that is why if we can, if a manufacturer can give you a monolithic uh, processes, that's the best that uh, a clinician will want to. The next is going to go into technique development. I have about um, 15 minutes to go into technique development. Okay. Um, we are going to focus on adhesion mechanism because resin bonded bridge is all about adhesive. And when you talk about adhesion, it involves the cementation protocol. So just a list of the protocol is started with try-in. And number two is about the surface treatment procedure, which we will discuss more on this, the resin looting cement application and the minimal finishing. I am putting two different kind of resin bonded bridges. One on your left side is the porcelain fused to metal and on your right side is the all ceramic material. Okay, when we talk about bonding, when we cement a prosthesis, we have to remember we are not just putting the teeth and also the prosthesis together. We have another layer in the middle, which is the looting uh, cement. So basically, if we look microscopically, the bonding, we have four bonding uh, surfaces to be treated or to be, uh, to be treated um, during cementation for the adhesion. Okay, the enamel, sorry, the enamel, uh, between enamel and looting, looting is mostly done with resin cement. So between enamel and looting, we will apply the dentin bonding agent and the looting, which is a resin cement and the processes, this is where silane uh, play the part. Silane and dentin bonding agent both are by, by molecular, it has two hands so that one hand will hold the enamel and one hand will hold the resin cement. And for the silane, it has two hands also. One will be holding the looting and the other one will be holding the prosthesis. Bonding on two surfaces. Okay, going back a bit on the history, it started with Bonacore in 1955. Concept of adhesion in dentistry is like the father of bonding. Uh, he started with etching the enamel and seeing all the enamel rod, uh, rod open uh, for bonding uh, mechanism. Nakabayashi in 1982 uh, found about the bonding to dentin with the understanding of hybrid layer. So I am not promoting any brand here. It's just to show that uh, the different type of bonding agent. And this one is a two bottle system where one is the primer and the other one is uh, adhesive bottle. So what we have understand during our undergraduate study, when we learn about composite, um, about how it actually, the hybrid layer actually helps in retention. So a same, the same mechanism is happening with the resin cement because it's also a composite resin. Okay, uh, bonding of processes surfaces. Sometimes, yes, the manufacturer give the instruction on the um, plier or the, the pamphlet of the cement. However, uh, it is not stated uh, about the bonding processes surfaces on the metal retainer, meaning that the surface treatment. Uh, this first slide is just to tell you about historically, if you can see the images from dental tra uh, traumatology in 2012 is about the perforated. This is where resin bonded bridges started, where they think that by having this perforation is a mechanical retention that will hold the resin bonded bridges. However, it was found that this macro um, retention uh, actually creates more leaking uh, at the interface of the um, perforated. Mesh retention, acrylic bead size. This acrylic bead size is actually put at the fitting surface and is to create some roughness. And the Virginia salt technique is also about incorporating uh, salt crystal size and remove during the waxing and leaving the cubic retentive bits. So this slide is actually talking about the macro mechanical, which is historically and not advisable nowadays. So what we are doing on the metal retainer, if you have uh, adhesive uh, resin bonded bridges 
uh, made from porcelain infused to metal, your retainer should be um, treated to provide a micro mechanical retention so it can etching can be done electrochemical or chemical method but most of the time this is what we do the sand blasting the sand blasting using 50 micron alumina to produce a rough outside surface and the chemical bonding yes some manufacturer will give you some metal primer application and also a silane application if um uh, if the manufacturers uh, it include in the uh, resin cement protocol the next one is about the ceramic. Okay, this is where it's very important for us to know what type of ceramic has been provided by the laboratory. Because uh, some laboratory, they have invested in a new milling machine of zirconia. So every time you order an all ceramic processes, they will provide you with zirconia. Yes, uh, more studies have been conducted and it has been improved the bonding of zirconia. Initially, zirconia is um, a ceramic which is not bondable at all. So meaning that if you provide a crown uh, made from zirconia, you are relying on the geometry to preparation for your, which is your total of conversion, the clinical crown height, the groove, and the surfaces. How, however, nowadays a lot. If you if you just Google zirconia bonding, you will have like thousand and thousand of studies being conducted, and it has been um, concluded. I would say uh, that tribochemical silica coating and zirconia primer actually helps to bond zirconia to to structure. But for lithium disilicate, because it has remember the photo on the glass matrix inside a uh, lithium disilicate, which is a silica-based ceramic. You can etch to remove that glassy matrix with the ceramic hydrofluoric acid, the 9.5%, which will then create your micro-mechanical retention as if that you etch your dentin and you have that, that opening of dentinal tubule. So the same thing actually happens in a silica-based porcelain. Once you etch, you will have that micromechanical retention. And this is one of the study that I quoted uh, from Abu Tara in 2011, airborne silica particle and MDP, phosphate ester monomer. Failure was more cohesive in the resin cement. So they bonded a zirconia to the tooth and the failure was not at the interface, at the adhesive uh, interface. It is more cohesive, which means it happens in the resin cement. That means during the testing, the bonding was much stronger than the resin cement. So that's why the failure is more cohesive in resin cement. Okay, a bit on resin cement, about uh, resin cement, glass and normal cement and zinc phosphate. Just to remind everyone that, including myself, that whenever we receive any cement to understand the bonding mechanism for each cement type. Sometimes they provide some primer that you may be used or sometimes they will tell you that you need to use a dentin bonding agent. Understand the curing process of each cement and be aware of the cement manipulation. Just to show some photo about cementation, which sometimes we skip when you are when we are using resin cement, the most important, same as resin composite restoration, moisture control is very important. So placing a rubber dam will be the best and the ideal situation to control your moisture. And remove the excess cement because once it is cured, it's very hard to remove the resin cement, right? So remove the excess cement before curing. However, um, some has advised that the uh, spot cure, like one second, will eventually um, make the resin cement a bit um, um, thick so that it will be much easier to remove. However, Studies has been conducted that sometimes when you remove it in a gel uh, phase, you might uh, accidentally pull a bit of your resin cement at the interfaces, especially when your margin is not uh, really close and fit. So that is why um, some clinicians, they do not do this spot cure and they will just remove it during the uncure. And once they are confident that the, the, the gross removal of the cement is done, they will cure it uh, straight away. 
So it actually depends on your option. Okay. Um, allow me to talk about the um, space for the retainer. Remember, we talk about the occlusal surface preparation. I show you the photograph, the diagram about the thickness of enamel. The next one is application of dull concept, which is known as relative axial to movement, which means the bridges which means uh, there is no preparation done for the retainer space. Therefore, the, the bridges is going to be cemented in slightly high occlusion. So is it a concern? Are we worried about it? Most of the time, yes, we do. Because when we provide a direct restoration, we always check the occlusion, right? We do not want to have high bite. But why we are providing resin bonded bridges in a high occlusion and is it a concern? about it. Okay, a bit on dull concept, the history. It's a method to increase vertical space, especially for worn teeth. Nowadays, it has been used commonly for ADC bridges with or no minimal preparation, as I said. Using the concept of relative axial to movement where 40% of intrusion will actually happen at the high bite um, region, an eruption of the non-contact teeth, about 60% will occur. So DAL started uh, as a removal metal bite platform worn at a certain area of dentition to create space. So it, uh, for studies, it was called DAL concept because DAL actually, the person or the individual uh, who studies on this concept. So four studies was done from 1980 to 1990s on the use of removable cobalt chrome anterior bite plane. This is where they noticed that, yes, they provide a high occlusion to open the space at the back. And they noticed that eventually the teeth will become in contact and the anterior teeth has a bit has intruded. The anterior teeth, which is biting on the uh, cobalt chrome anterior bite plane. And Ricketts in 1993 introduced a different technique to produce relative axial to movement. Hemmings 2000 started to use composite resin to increase the vertical dimension in two surface loss cases. And Briggs started to use resin bonded gold alloy veneer to increase vertical dimension. So meaning a lot of researchers have started to use um, the dull concept to increase uh, the space uh, and what they are providing is a certain area will be in high occlusion. So Poison in 2005, uh, the DAL concept has been reviewed, the past, present and future. They were looking at all the different uh, studies ha that has been conducted. And what they found that time for space creation and time uh, is about uh, for DAL, 6 to 14 months, uh, Go and Hemming, 6 to 12 months. So these are all about the occlusal re-establishment from the time that the space is created. So, yes, is there any adverse effect? If we think um, logically, definitely yes, because even for ourselves, if we have something high bite, we won't feel comfortable. So it has been reported that palpal symptom, yes, did occur. Periodontal problem, 3 to 10%. TMJ disorder, about 4%. However, no apical root resorption has occurred. So this is actually the same concept, what I think is the same concept in orthodontic, where the orthodontist is moving your teeth and there are times that you will feel some of this adverse effect, the, the, the discomfort, the pain and, and thing. But eventually we will adapt and the occlusion will get much better after that. So survival evidence of resin bonded bridges, um, anterior resin bonded bridges, the mean service life is 206, uh, about 18 years. This one is from Botello. And yes, he did a study to compare between cantilever and fixed fix design, where he found that there is no complication on cantilever. However, for fixed fix design, about 90% complication has occurred. And a meta, uh, meta analysis by uh, Peterson in 2008 reported 23% debonding after five years for posterior teeth. That is why, um, yes, for posterior teeth, uh, it has to be cautiously provided, this resin bonded bridges, compared to anterior teeth. And Kern in 2017 reported a failure for about for five years, 43%. Ceramic uh, glass infiltrated alumina anterior cantilever survived 81.8% after 18 years of clinical services. 
So um, it actually this paper shows that lithium disilicate is not strong enough to be uh, used as a bridge, uh, even a cantilever bridge. Zirconia RBB has a 82.7% survival rate. Uh, this is reported by Shahdat. Okay, I just wanted to allow me to share two of the current uh, the studies that uh, our team has conducted on resin bonded bridges. This one has been published in General Prostorantic Dentistry, Clinical Factors Affecting Occlusal Reestablishment. Yes, because when we came back from our study in UK, not the resin bonded bridge is not popular yet at that time. So we started to do quite a number of resin bonded bridges from 2013 to 18. So we did a retrospective study to look back at the, these clinical parameters, number of missing teeth, number of RBB, and uh, the arch and site. Our aim is to look at the patient's uh, complaint on discomfort or any um, TMJ. And then the, the other uh, aim is to look at the occlusal reestablishment. So 151 resin border bridges were reviewed in 109 patients, about 7.8 months. And we found that all the following parameters was not significant to affect the occlusal reestablishment. Means that patient demography, it doesn't matter it's a female or male, number of missing tooth, but we actually look at a uh, single and uh, double missing teeth, number of uh, resin bonded bridges cemented in a patient, and the parameter where the location, whether it's a mandibular or maxillary, or if it's a anterior or posterior. The photograph shows one of the cases. If you can see, uh, during the insertion day, there was a space. Only the resin bonded bridges are in contact with the opposing teeth. However, during the review visit, all the other dentition has uh, re-established on the occlusion. So as a summary for the result, the occlusal re-establishment actually happens 100%. It's just that 89.9% was a full uh, re-establishment, means that what we recorded um, before pre-treatment has been achieved during the review visit, even though in between a resin bonded bridges was cemented high and 10.1% was a partial uh, re-establishment. However, we think that if we review the patient much longer, we might have 100% of occlusal re-establishment. The other studies that I conducted, because remember we were talking and the literature have shown that lithium disilicate is not strong enough to be a resin bonded bridges anterior. However, there are still um, requests or there are still need uh, because of the aesthetic purposes uh, of lithium disilicate. So what our team are doing now is we are conducting a study to look at uh, all ceramic resin bonded bridges. But the first part of the study, we are utilizing finite element analysis to evaluate the stress distribution pattern of our anterior resin bonded bridges, different material and connector design. From the table, you can see we are looking at rectangular and trapezoidal. The reason for trapezoidal because sometimes anatomically you will have an anterior teeth which is quite thin from the uh, cross section. So you cannot provide a rectangular shape of connector because that will encroach your palatal surface. So that's why we tested on this and we tested on different heights and width of the um, design using finite element analysis. So the finding of our study is quite general, similar to what is expected. The integrity of the bridge connector is affected by the material type, shape, and dimension. Generally, when the height is altered, but the width was fixed, there was a higher amount of stress. And we found that uh, when we look, it seems that lithium disilicate, because when we load it, we actually load it in 100 Newton, 150, and 200 Newton because uh, we were looking at the literature and the female patient actually have about 80 to 120 uh, masticatory load. So we found that lithium disilicate, if you load it 150 and 200 in all the dimension that we, stay, we tested, it failed, meaning that it cannot withstand. However, in patient with low uh, masticatory force, Lithium disilicate at a certain connector height will survive, the, uh, the processes will survive. 
Therefore, uh, from the current from this final element study, we are moving towards an in vitro study and possibly in the future to go for a clinical study on this design. So I would say as a summary, um, resin bonded bridges or adhesive bridges, or some we call it Maryland bridge, is a predictable prognosis treatment. However, you have to do a proper case selection and planning. Uh, you have to look at the criteria, the parameters that we have discussed, and then the decent execution of treatment procedure. And with the um, advance in material and with the improvement in terms of adhesion mechanism, I would say that this prosthesis has a very good prognosis and it has been proven in literature nowadays. And last but not least, a good rapper with the patient is very important. Whatever we provide to the patient, the success and the longevity does not rely on us 100%. I would say it is 50-50. The way the patient cleans it, uh, clean it and the way the patient uh, use the prosthesis during her daily function, that will uh, also affect the longevity and the survival of the prosthesis. I think a bit too much info for uh, for tonight. So let's take some Q&A from the audience if we have any. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siti Mariam, uh, for very interesting and factual uh, presentation. Yeah, we have uh, two questions from the Q&A. The first question is from uh, Lily Wijajad from Indonesia, most probably. She asked, uh, how is the step-by-step -step cementing zirconia crown using zirconia primer? Mm. Okay, uh, thank you, Brother Dato. I can see that the second question is also about cement, uh, about zirconia crown, about sandblasting. Okay, um, yes, uh, zirconia, because it doesn't, oh, I think I forgot to mention about it. Zircon, thank you for the question from Lily and... Uh, Anonymous. Uh, zirconia, as we know, it is a non silica base. So, meaning that it doesn't have a silica in the composition to hold to the resin cement. So, the treatment protocol that has been widely used is to do sandblasting with alumina silica. So, when you do sandblasting with alumina silica, with zirconia, you can actually go up to 50 micron. You are actually creating a bit of uh, micro roughness. And at the same time, you are embedding some silica particles into the zirconia surface. So that will actually help uh, during the retention uh, with the silane later. And then the zirconia primer, it depends on the uh, manufacturer. Some uh, will uh, provide it and it is a step uh, that you can use it uh, before your uh, resin cement application. But I think... Uh, there are also uh, manufacturers who provide the zirconia primer by itself so that you can uh, utilize it after the sandblasting. However, uh, after sandblasting, the best is to clean it under ultrasonic uh, water bath. The reason is because studies have shown that if we do sandblasting and we clean it under uh, water or even with our two-way syringe, there are still remaining uh, particles, uh, loose particle uh, embedded inside, which is uh, going to compromise your adhesion. So if you use a ultrasonic water bath, all the loose particles that is embedded during the sandblasting will be removed and you will get a very nice micro-mechanical uh, roughness uh, for your uh, bonding mechanism. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I go for further questions, just like to welcome our Vice President, Professor Dr. Ashar Malik here, who has joined us tonight, and also uh, the Dean, Faculty of Dentistry, UITM, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Aida, who also has joined in the webinar. Uh, Professor Ashar Malik, yeah, welcome, Thank and you. also uh, from Aida. So, uh, Mr. Mariam, I just have to ask you, uh, there is two material that you indicate in your lecture just now about um, ceramic and um, metal. Uh, is mm -hmm. there 
term of thickness of preparation, is there any difference or it should be more thickness for uh, zirconi, I mean, uh, ceramic? Okay, uh, thank you, Prof, for the question. Okay, for metal, as we all know, metal can be casted uh, down to 0 0.5 millimeter. Uh, however, for it to, if it's on the occlusal surface to be safe, we need about 0 0.7 millimeter. Uh, but for if you, um, the one that I presented just now in a porcelain fused to metal, at the margin also, we do not do any preparation because at the margin, meaning at the palatal or lingual, you can actually go down to 0 0.3 millimeter in casting the metal. So a 0 0.3 millimeter, if you bond it to a tooth surface, yes, it will be a slight bump, but it will not be to the extent that plug accumulation will occur. However, if we remember on the diagram that I show on, on all ceramic, you notice that we have to have a slight uh, chamfer margin at the palatal and the lingual because as thin as we want it to be, a uh, ceramic cannot be casted to 0 0.3 unless it's a veneer, yes, you can. But for a resin bonded bridge, eventually it will go down to 0 0.5 to maybe about one millimeter. So that is why for all ceramic, we need to have a bit of preparation so that uh, during the bonding, you will have quite a smooth transition between your processes and your tooth structure so that it will not interfere with your plaque accumulation. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Timariam. Uh, I see here that our vice president is, are you still in Cambodia or have you go back? Yeah, I, I reached that. <laughs> I reach at Chakwal right in my bedroom. That <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I will love that. Uh, uh, Mariam, uh, your uh, so excellent presentation that I remember the same type of presentation. I have just gone to uh, um, uh, non pen and listened to Datu Ibrahim presentation, and it's so deeply regarding the latest material of uh, uh, in uh, operative dentistry, and it was so astonishing. His paper was that uh, approximately he taken a uh, uh, time, and I. Uh, it was so interesting that being chairman, I requested that please continue because uh, it is so important to understand the latest material by uh, all of us, uh, which we don't know. Uh, uh, Mariam, my reservation regarding to your topic is that when we have the enamel dysplasia, when we have the dentine uh, dysplasia and uh, uh, dentine problems and then we have fluoresces and then when we have the mottling of the teeth uh, the materials bonding is very compromised yep. and whether do you win sand blasting whether you go for the uh, acid etching whether you go for the uh, laser utilization for roughness uh, and all these parameters generally fails and then you have to go for the mechanical retention mm -hmm. uh, retention like uh, conventional bridges. Uh, what is your opinion regarding these type of limitation uh, on uh, your uh, uh, topic? Thank you, Doctor, for your uh, question. Yes, I do agree um, that when that's why during the case selection, it's very important to assess the uh, surfaces that we are going to bond our processes because uh, resin bonded bridges. It's a sole. Um, Adhesion, uh, adhesion is the sole mechanism for it to be retained. So in a condition with fluoresces and hypoplasia, yes, we have a compromised um, bonding substrate. Even though we'll do all sort of treatment, surface treatment on the processes, probably the processes and the resin cement will bond very well. However, the resin cement and the two structure will have a compromised bonding. So what for me, um, because uh, if it's a young patient, and uh, I will try to go for adhesive first because it will give some time for the patient maybe to utilize it for a few more years. Before it fails, repeated failure, then I will proceed to a conventional. 
because um, I will always give the first try to adhesion to be minimal invasive, to be uh, not cutting the two structure. However, if it keep on failing because the type of failure, it's more on superstructure. It's not um, catastrophic. So if it fails, then I will move towards my geometry to preparation, retention, and resistance, which is crown prep and probably a bit of groove here and there and interproximal boxes. So that's how I will approach this kind of cases. Uh, that's fine, uh, lady. Just uh, my uh, uh, just addition to with permission to the um, Datu. May, may I ask one question? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this uh, uh, just uh, uh, the incidence of caries and uh, incidence of uh, caries uh, with reference to cemento and amble junction and beneath that. What is your uh, concept regarding the razor bonding uh, materials and uh, procedure? Uh, so we're talking about the caries uh, incident in resin bonded bridges. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it has been reported. Uh, it is very low because of the design of a retainer is very simple. And most of the time it's very super, it's super structure. And it covers only at the palatal and the lingual surfaces. Instead of a crown and... Um, the conventional where you have a margin all around and involving the interproximal where it's, it's known to be an area where patients have difficulty to clean, the incidence of caries is much, much higher in, in, in the conventional crown and bridge preparation. For resin bonded bridges, if you have a good surfaces and it's super structure, and if we look into the failure reported, uh, Highest is always debonding and also fracture of the prosthesis. Caries incident is very minimal. However, it does happen, especially when you have the fixed fixed design and you have debonding at one side and patient doesn't notice. So caries might develop under the debond retainer. So that has uh, some been people used to say that the because its whole design is toward the lingual side. And the mm. brushing of the patient on the lingual side is always very compromised because they, they don't look at it. And uh, mm. it is just a blind brushing. And they are agreed that uh, on if it is on the uh, um, uh, facial surface, then the patient used to have good brushing due to aesthetic view. But due to its lingual side, that, uh, there is especially with reference to lower interiors, uh, it is uh, not so promising because due to opening of the um, uh, this uh, Barthon ducts as well. Mm, yes, I do agree. Lower anterior, a lot of patients have a lot of calculus at the lower anterior. It seems like the area which is quite, I don't, people miss a lot during brushing. I do agree on that. However, the retainer usually is uh, supra gingiva and should be able to clean uh, normally. Lah. But uh, but it does happen too. I do agree to that. But the incidence of caries in resident bonded bridge is, is quite low. Uh, based on the report and the studies conducted. Uh, Rosh Mariam, there's another question from our colleague here. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the interesting like, talk. Uh, my question is about preservative enamel for the bonding. Can you comment on the balance between enamel preservation and marginal preparation, especially for material like ceramic, lithium disilicate? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Aini, for the question. Uh, yes, uh, preserving enamel for bonding surface is the best. But uh, yes, I do agree. When we look at the old ceramic, I have to do, do, we have to do a margin because of the thickness of the material. However, the, the preparation is only at the margin. The, the whole uh, lingual or the palatal surface is not prepared. So you will still have a good amount of enamel on that surfaces. You will have a 0 0.5 uh, margin uh, at the lingual, uh, uh, at the palatal for your uh, thickness of your material. That is because we do not want to have a big, uh, like a over over contour 
if we do not do a margin. However, at the rest of the area, we do not do preparation. So you will still have a sufficient good amount of enamel to bond your processes and to be confident with the adhesive mechanism. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sister Mariam. I think uh, that should conclude uh, our uh, webinar tonight uh, because you want to see the World Cup at three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> Morocco versus France. By the way, um, uh, thank you very much, Dr. for this webinar. And um, uh, as usual, uh, ICD Section 15, I would like to thank you for, to you for sharing your, your knowledge and experience with our our participants tonight and uh, yours being the, uh, the last session of the year prosthodontics and beginning next year we also will start with prosthodontics this time is from Indonesia so uh, our speaker will be Dr. Mafina Konjoro from Indonesia and together we uh, also we have a uh, arrangement with Indonesian Prosthodontic Association so we have a lot of members will join in this uh, uh, meeting uh, webinar in January. We begin uh, and with a prosto and also we will start with a prosto in January. Again, uh, I would like to thank you um, to Professor Ma Mariam for the very interesting lecture. And also thank you to Prof. Prof. Uh, Ashad Malik and also uh, Dr. Aida Norashikin for joining us tonight. And um, uh, also thank you to my committee member tonight, uh, Dr. Amy Amelia from Indonesia and also Dr. Nagam for uh, uh, helping me in uh, making this arrangement for today's webinar. So we we'll meet again um, in uh, one month's time in January 18 on the title consideration for implant placement in diabetic patient. So till then, uh, we wish you Happy New Year and uh, Happy the 23. And for those who are celebrating Christmas, uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Good night and bye bye. See you all. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Thank you.